All right, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 40. Forty in the Bible is a, a number of judgment. Uh, interesting to, to note, there was rain happening 40 days and 40 nights. So the flood of Noah occurred. Goliath came out and for 40 days mocked the children of Israel. The Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And even when they inflicted the scourgings, as Jesus even endured, it was 40 but minus one for mercy. Hopefully you didn't lose count. But here in chapter 40 of Genesis, we see a judgment issued forth. It's a very interesting chapter. It's kind of a whodunit mystery that has a conclusion at the end, uh, the case being solved. But ultimately, what we're seeing in Joseph li- Joseph's life is that God is working in Joseph, character. God is working through Joseph, ministry. And here he is 11 years waiting for God to do something. He's faithful in what's before him. He's taken the opportunities in the, even the small ways to be used by the Lord. And there's some great lessons for us, no matter where we're at, in being used by the Lord. As we look at the life of Joseph, as we see the reflection of Jesus, ultimately, in these, this, this passage. Chapter 40, verse 1. It came to pass, after these things, that the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief butler and the chief baker, So he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison, the place where Joseph was confined. Who is this butler and baker? The butler is not like, you know, Batman's butler with Alfred that's all posh and, you know, looking good. Nor is it like Lurch, you rag, you know, the Adams family type of thing. The word butler actually would be equivalent to a cup bearer. This was the guy that was over the whole vineyard. The guy that was in charge of the king's wine. He was the one that would actually taste the cup before giving it to the king to make sure it wasn't poisoned along the way by someone who just had an ought against the king, or Pharaoh in this case. So this man became one of the most trusted advisors for the king. His life, basically the king's life was in his hands. So he'd take a sip, and I'm sure they would wait a few moments to see if somebody keeled over or not. But one of the most famous cupbearers that we know of would be that of Nehemiah, the one who writes the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 2. He was a cupbearer for the king of Persia and how God used him in a mighty way. What about the baker? The baker is simply the cook, the chief cook. He would prepare the king's meals. This is Chef Boyardee back in the day. He's rolling along, you know, Wolfgang Puck doing his thing back there, and evidently something happened that offended the king. Literally, it's sinned against the king. And the king takes these two guys and throws them in the slammer until they can figure it out. It wasn't like a burnt meal and bad wine type of thing. No, the Jewish tradition actually says that there was a conspiracy, an attempt upon the king's life to poison him, whether by food or by drink. And so until they could solve the matter, he throws them in the slammer and... uh, Uh, investigates the case. And it says there in verse 3 that they're put under Potiphar's uh, custody. He is the uh, captain of the guard, as we talked about it in chapter 39, verse 1. In Potiphar's prison, in the place where Joseph was confined, that God is setting the stage for something. Ultimately, the Lord put these guys in there that they would meet Joseph as God is working his plan in such a sovereign way. In verse 4, it tells us the captain of the guard, that's Potiphar, He charged Joseph with them, and he served them, so they were in custody for a while, or uh, many days. Potiphar was still in contact with Joseph. That's why I think, and I shared it last week, that he wasn't sure of, you know, how do I deal with this thing? I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. My wife is making these claims, but I've got my faithful servant, Joe. I think Potiphar wanted to find a way to get Joseph out of prison, back into his house. He's a trustworthy guy. But here he's even showing us the very fact 
that Potiphar still valued Joseph and gave him responsibility there in the prison of watching over these two guys. He cared for them, gave him food, gave him water, gave him a, a work detail. But it says there that he served them. It means that he waited upon them as a minister, as a servant. And there are really five traits as we look at this chapter, five traits of being used by the Lord in difficult circumstances. And the first one that you might note is the word servant. That Joseph had a servant's heart in difficult circumstances. You remember Paul, Acts chapter 28. There he's been ignored as he said, guys, we don't want to set sail. We don't want to set sail. I, I, there's going to be great danger ahead. Man, what do you know? So the captain sets off. And they encounter an incredibly violent storm. They're lost at sea for two weeks. I'm sure Paul's going, so I listened. Until finally, they're shipwrecked there upon an island, the island of, of Malta. The island of Malta. And you think, did he stop serving at that point? Did he say, man, you guys, you won't listen to me. You won't do these things. I'm done. It's over. No, the, the text tells us there in Acts 28 that he set out and he gathered some firewood. He's going to make a fire. He's going to warm up the, the prisoners and anybody else on the island. And then all of a sudden, as he grabs the sticks, what happens? A viper whoosh, grabs his hand. And at that point, if I was Paul, I would have went, seriously, Lord? Really? Is this what I get? That's, that's our reaction. But the text tells us that he simply just Shook it off into the fire. Shook it off into the fire. Of course, the people at that time, they said, oh, you know what? He must, he must be a murderer. He's getting his due. And that's, people are fickle. That's going to happen, you know? And then when he doesn't swell up like the marshmallow man and puff over and die, they think, oh, he must be a god. Oh, am I a murderer or a god? What's the deal here? But what I love about Paul is that even at that point, Knowing the people are fickle, he's been bitten by a snake and he's been through a storm, that he doesn't just go, you know what, I am done with you all. Forget this, next ship, I'm out of here. Well, he's a prisoner, I guess he couldn't do that. But his heart attitude wasn't such. It says there that he continued to minister to people, laid hands upon the sick, went to the governor of the island, a servant, that when he left that place, there wasn't a sour taste, there was a blessing. As they all got on a ship heading for Rome, the people were blessed. It wasn't just the message. It was the servant. And we want to be used by God in difficult circumstances. We first have to look at our heart. Lord, am I a servant? I love what A.B. Simpson says. He says, God is not looking for extraordinary characters as his instruments, but he's looking for humble instruments through whom he can be honored through the ages. And so you and I, there comes points where we really have to, let's get over the difficult circumstances. It's difficult, yes. It's hard. But let's not keep those things from robbing us of the joy of serving Jesus. Let's not get sour. Let's not get to those places where we say, you know what, I've been bit by a snake. Give me a break. I'm not serving you. The reality is, is you're going to get a lot of snake bites from serving the Lord. It's going to happen. It's part of how the Lord grows us. But when our heart is sensitive to say, Lord, no matter the snake bites, no matter the storms, I'm just going to press with you and serve you. I want my heart useful and moldable. That's what we find. That the Lord is saying, now I'm preparing you for what's next. The work that he wants to do in us and through us. And life still remains fresh with the Lord. Verse 5. Then the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt whom were confined in the prison had a dream. Both of them each man's dream in one night and each man's dream with its own interpretation. And Joseph came in to them in the morning and looked at them and saw that they were sad. And throughout the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, we find that God often spoke through men through dreams. Even as we studied, uh, Jacob had a dream there, the latter going to heaven, and the Lord had uh, words for him there. We see uh, uh, in the next chapter, we'll see Pharaoh who has this dream uh, and it had to do prophetically with the situations, the famine times uh, coming upon Egypt. Uh, we see Nebuchadnezzar having dreams, dealing with not only him, but the history of humanity in the book of Daniel. And so it was often the, cu the culture uh, that dreams were considered a special avenue for the supernatural to interact with the natural. 
Joel chapter 2, verse 28, tells us, It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Dreams happening at night, visions when you were awake. The old men having dreams, young men seeing visions. Why is that the case? Because old guys nap more than young guys do. Right? <laughs> God wants to speak to you. Hey, you got to get up, buddy. <laughs> okay, I'll take you where you're at. But I remember I must be an old guy because at 17, the Lord had given me a dream. It doesn't happen all the time, but I was at Bible college and a particular dream that just incredibly troubled me in the morning, and I was sharing it with a uh, fellow there, and, and he turned to me and he says, you know what, I think the Lord uh, has given me the interpretation of that dream. And, and what he spoke was exactly the things I was going through. Not only that, it was the things that the Lord was taking me through in the next years to come. Uh, and uh, it was in just an absolute thing. Of all my life, the only dream that God had given me. So at 17, I must have been an old man. And at 40, I'm on the verge of death, right? <laughs> so anyways, here is these, these dreams. And and though God may speak to us through dreams, I think we do have to be careful, though, because not every dream is a revelation from God. Some of it may be the issue of what you ate the night before, you know, and you have this dream of hanging out with Dennis Rodman and doing these things. You're either in North Korea or you're having one crazy meal the night before that's freaking you out. Sometimes it's the stress of the day. Sometimes it's the anxieties or fears of the future. Sometimes the dreams are just an issue of events playing out in a crazy way. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 3 tells us a dream comes through much activity. That's where it comes from. And we have to be careful because Deuteronomy 13 tells us that even false prophets will use dreams to back up their false message. We must be careful. Nevertheless, the Lord does speak through dreams and the butler and the baker each had their own dream the same night it troubled them the next morning. God was up to something. And verse 6 tells us that when Joseph was kind of making his rounds, he looked at them and noticed that they were depressed, that they were sad. This, I think, is the second thing in being used by the Lord. There's five of them. The first, having that servant's heart. The second thing, you notice Joseph was sensitive. And I think that's a real key. In difficult circumstances, he's sensitive. He's aware of their others' circumstances, how it's affecting their life. He's not locked into his own world, just going, oh, bummer, bummer me, grumbling, complaining, you know, about all the events that have happened. He's, he's others-oriented. He's sensitive to what's happening in others' lives, and not just because it's his job, but because of the, the work of the Lord in his own life. And there he saw and he sensed that God was doing something or something was going on, something different in the life of these guys, and he stopped. Like Peter and John heading to the gate of beautiful, seeing the beggar, moved by the Holy Spirit, they stop. And God does a miraculous work. I think about Jesus, of course, the great example that we have. Jairus comes and says, Lord, come and, and heal my daughter. She's, she's sick. She's on the verge of death, my 12-year-old daughter. And the Lord goes, let's go. He starts going, and there is a woman with the issue of blood that in the mix of the multitude reaches through and says, if only I may touch his robe. And as the multitude is thronging and pressing Jesus, he stops. And he says what? Who touched me? The disciples are going, are you kidding? Everybody's trying to touch you. No, no, no. I felt power go forth. Who touched me? And the Lord did an incredible work in her life as well. But he was sensitive. And it's important for us to be sensitive as well to the Spirit of God. And Joseph here stops. And then he asks a question, which is the third thing. He's searching. Being used by God in difficult circumstances. Have a servant's heart. Have a sensitivity to allow the Lord to stop you in your tracks. Not just keep going about with the job. And then third, be searching. Look what he says in verse 7. And so he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in the custody of his Lord's house, saying, why do you look so sad today? Now, obviously, if we take it from one angle, we go, dude, you're in prison. Every day is a sad day. Joseph's not like, hee, 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 hee. it's a good day with, you know. He's really having a hard time as well. 
But there was something troubling them. Something was different than the night before and the issues. There was something going on. And he simply asked the question, why are you so sad? At this point, I don't think Joseph's looking to fix them. At this point, Joseph is simply, as a servant of the Lord, wanting to share how the Lord has carried him through his own trials and difficulties and sadnesses. You see, there can be an incredible work of God as we simply throw out the question relationally with people. What's up? The coworker comes in. Yesterday they were excited. Today, man, they just look like their world collapsed. Don't just go about with the job. Ask the question. Hey, I noticed something's different. What's up? And let the Lord use your life, how he's encouraged you in the midst of difficulties to share with them and, and, and let them see what the Lord has for them. We say, Lord, give us your eyes to see people as you see them, to see others with the same heart. And here we see Joseph giving us a great example to be sensitive and not just pass by. The Lord opens up a door for Joseph. He opens up a door for us. And in verse 8, and they said to him, we each have had a dream and there is no interpreter of it. So Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell them to me, please. They're all bummed out. They don't understand the dream they had. And, and Joseph, I, I love what he does. He gets right to the point. He says, doesn't God give interpretation? Doesn't the future belong to him? And, and I think that's really the, the fourth thing, being used in difficult times. You need the servant's heart. You need the sensitivity to the spirit. You need to have the searching questions to see if God's going to open the door. But you need to speak the truth in boldness. You need to let them know who the Lord is. You don't need the, the self-help or the philosophy or the culture of the day. You need to know that the Lord God, He holds the answers that men are looking for. The questions that would be there. Daniel took the same approach. I think he learned from Joseph because when Nebuchadnezzar had his dreams and they're looking for someone to interpret it, Daniel says the same thing in Daniel 2.26 or 28. Interpretations belong to God. He can reveal. He knows the future. And so he speaks boldly as the source of truth. And it's always a, a thing for us to remember that we want to connect our world with God's word. We want people to see that it's not just a coincidence, but the Lord is really directing steps and moving things together that men may see Jesus Christ, the hope of their salvation. The Lord has a goal in mind. Why is God allowing this in my life? Why is the Lord doing this? Why are these things happening? Because he wants you to see Jesus. If you put it in a nutshell, every man to see Jesus high and lifted up as the King, as the Lord, as the Savior. That's where we need to be. The fifth thing that he points out is that he, in this servant heart, you might say, in this issue of being used by God, is, is a step, he steps out in faith. I, I love this because he put himself in a place to be used by God. If God is the one who knows the future, then tell me your dream. You see, the worst case, Joseph is simply saying, I've got a listening ear to hear your troubles. But in the best case, Joseph is saying, if the Lord wants to use me, Tell it to me. Let's see what the Lord does. It's an incredible step of faith. Warren Wiersbe said this. He said, Ministry takes place when divine resources meet human needs through loving channels for the glory of God. That's what ministry is. Divine resources meeting human needs through a loving channel for the glory of God. Why was Joseph so interested when these guys mentioned the word dreams? Because Joseph had had his own dreams. Joseph knew what it was to be misjudged. And in compassion, he's throwing himself out there to identify with these guys and see how the Lord would use him. And so the first guy in verse 9, the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, Behold, in my dream, a vine was before me. And in the vine were three branches. It was as though it budded, it blossoms, shot forth, and its clusters brought forth ripe grapes. Then Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and, the place, and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. 
Now within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your place, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand according to the former manner when you were his butler. So the first dream is given by the butler, and uh, probably because he knows he's innocent in heart. And Joseph gives the interpretation of it. Three days from now, you're going to be restored back to your place of service. Pharaoh will lift up your head, and it brings hope to this butler that the Lord is in charge. And yet it's also a risk for Joseph. He's three days. He's either true or false. And so these things are taking place, coming to pass here. In verse 14, it says there, he says, But remember me when it is well with you, and please show kindness to me, make mention of me to Pharaoh, and get me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews, and also I have done nothing here that they should put me into the dungeon. You see, if the butler was going to be restored, he'd remember this time in prison. And so what does Joseph say? Remember me. We get a little peek into Joseph's heart. This was not easy for him. It's been years. He's there in prison. And though serving his best in what's before him, he's hurting. And he knows that only Pharaoh can grant that pardon. And so he says, hey, when you get back into that place, remember me and speak about me that I may be delivered from this place. I don't want to be here. And of course, Joseph knows he's innocent. He says, I don't even belong here. I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews. He's not a political prisoner accused of espionage. He's just simply a misplaced man, you might say. But it's a wise, it's a logical plan. He's making the best of the, most of, of the opportunity. But deliverance comes from the Lord. And he knows that. Verse 16. And when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said to Joseph, I also was in my dream, and there were three white baskets on my head. In the uppermost basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh, and the birds ate them out of the basket on my head. And so Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation of it. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds, of the eat, the birds will eat your flesh from you. Have a nice day. <laughs> of course, the, uh, the baker sees the positive things out of the butler's dream, and I think in heart he knows he's guilty. But he says, well, here's my dream. And he throws it out. It was customary in the Egyptian culture for men to carry things on their head. If you've ever been in other countries and think, wow, how do they do that? I've been there. And I think, man, incredible balance. But they'd carry things, even food on their head. And the problem with the baker is he didn't have a lid, in a sense, on, on the dream. And the birds were eating out of the basket on his head. Something wasn't right. And the end verdict is simply guilty. You can't fool God. Until so Joseph says, hey, three days from now, uh, you're going to be executed. You're going to be hanged on a tree as a warning to all that there is judgment coming to you. And of course, the butler's head was lifted up and the baker's head would be lofted off. One decapitated, the other uh, is um, reinstated. But what I love about Joseph is he's willing to give the bad news and good news. See, some will just give you good news. They'll never tell you bad news. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. The kisses of an enemy are deceitful, Proverbs says. He's willing to give you, in a sense, the, the baker and the butler sermon. That we might hear it. That we might uh, be warned and turn from sin. And we might realize there is a judgment coming upon sin. It's not just all happy, happy. It's hope, hope. That we might return and repent and, and place our faith in Jesus Christ. Speak the truth in love from brokenness as a faithful servant of the Lord. Verse 20. Now it came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all his servants and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants then he restored the chief butler to his butlership again, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. It was Pharaoh's birthday, three days. The verdict of the whodunit case is solved, and he brings out both these guys, and the butler is cleared of the crime and restored back to service. But the baker, the cook, is hanged on a tree. Shish kebab baker. That's what happened. 
Of course, his head is lopped off and they impale him on a pole as a warning for all that don't mess with the king. Kind of a crazy thing. But God did just as Joseph has said to the detail as the, the, the butler is, is pouring the wine into the king's hand. I think this gave a little hope for Joseph. Lord, I remember you gave me dreams a long time ago. I was thrown in a pit for it. I wonder if they're ever going to come to pass. And the Lord says, hey, look, I'm able to fulfill the very things that I've said. It it gave him hope. But there's a bigger picture at store for us. A bigger picture we always want to see is that of Jesus in the scripture. And I want to point out a few things. Because Joseph becomes a type of Jesus, the bigger picture is this. Joseph is numbered with the transgressors in prison, identifying with them. Just as Jesus was with us in our mess, and Isaiah 53, verse 12 says that he made intercession for us. Jesus, I'm sorry, Joseph was in the company of two men in a conspiracy of murder, just as Jesus was with two thieves who were accused of murder. And in the same way, the butler was freed and restored, but the baker condemned to die on a tree, just as one thief on the cross was given a message of salvation and the other of condemnation. Verse 23, yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. That's a heavy scripture when you think about it. Joseph says, any day now, Lord, any day, any day, any day, and it dies. The hope for release kind of dies. And sometimes we find that our good intentions are overlooked by others. Lord, why didn't they? Why couldn't they? If they only would have, and we're getting our eyes on them, people. If they would have just done this, I would not be in this mess. But we really have to set our eyes upon the Lord. Lord, you know. You know. And it's difficult. I don't understand everything, but you know. And if we step outside of the situations and kind of look at this, we think, how in the world can this butler forget Three days, man. Three days. You've had this dream. It's happened exactly to the detail. I mean, seriously? How do you forget something like that? What's going on? Why did he forget? I would propose to you that God caused him to forget. God caused him to forget because God had something else in mind, something bigger. Joseph is looking at release for himself, but God is looking at the rescue of a nation through Joseph. And if Joseph would have been released, he probably would have headed right back to Canaan saying, Dad, I'm home. And Pharaoh, with his dreams and the issue there, he would have never been in place for that. God's working something. I love what David Guzik says. He says, God orders both our steps and our stops. God orders your stops. They're hard, but he orders them. He's in charge of them. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. It's natural, it's normal to want to get out of the fire when it's happening, when the difficulties are there, out of the sufferings. We may even throw out a plan or a prison break type of thing, but the Lord has the final word, always has the last word. Proverbs tells us a man directs his step, or man makes his plans, but the Lord directs his steps. And it's important for us to see that, that God is doing things in his way, in his time. He makes all things beautiful in his time for his glory. And we've got to trust him through those things. And Joseph's watching the next two years just unfold. And God's not working. But listen, God's not done. And maybe in your life, you're, you can relate with Joseph. You're in the midst of those difficulties and that issue. And you're going, Lord, what I thought would happen never happened. And here I am back in the same suffering. I, I, I don't know what to make of it. I don't even, you know, I just drool. That's all I do. It's all I can do. I don't understand anything of what you're doing. Take heart from Joseph. Look at God's word. I want to share with you two more scriptures. Isaiah chapter 49. Understand God's heart. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me and my Lord has forgotten me. Sound familiar? Can a woman forget her nursing child 
and not have compassion on the son of her womb? And naturally we think, no way. Well, in worst case scenarios, I guess you could say that. But he says, surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. And as a promise, in a sense, he says, see, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hand. Your walls are continually before me. Men may forget you, but God hasn't. And God says, listen, in a sense, like tying the string on the finger to remember, putting it in the smartphone with the alarm. The Lord says, I cannot forget you because of the cross and the marks that he bears in his hands. I will not forget you. I cannot forget you. I love you and know you by name. And I paid for your sins with my very blood. You're valued in his eyes. Well, how do I gain strength through those battles, through those trials, through those issues? Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 40. I want to give you the scripture and we'll close out with this. Isaiah chapter 40. Starting in verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God. Sound familiar? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. When you're in the midst of those trials, those prisons of hardship and heartache, number one, you fall back on who God is. That's exactly what it says there in verse 28. The everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, he's the one who doesn't faint. His ways are unsearchable. I'm not going to be able to figure out everything God does. But I need to fall back on who he is. Number two, I need to submit into his hands. Verse 29 tells us right there that he's going to give power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength, that he's ready and able to help and sustain and give grace for those things. Number three, I need to know that I'm not alone. Verse 30 tells us there that even the youths are going to faint. Even the young men are going to grow weary. This is not a a unique experience for you and you alone. Number four, that as you wait on the Lord expectantly, you will see God work mightily. Check it out. He's ready to renew you for what's ahead. Like an eagle that gets pushed out of the nest and carries and catches the wind and soars to new heights. That's the illustration there. Like a runner getting a a second wind in a race and says, hey, I'm going to press and finish this strong. Even like a steady walk forward without fainting and losing heart and falling short of all God has. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. But in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths.